This is concerning Alexander the Great and the Nephilim. Prophecy of St. Andrew of Crete, the Fool for Christ, concerning gates locking the Nephilim in India. Uh, we know that uh, at least 72 pyramids supposedly closing the gates of these Nephilim. The Nephilim that he couldn't get rid of, he uh, buried and uh, built pyramids over. Now we know that the ancient Greeks had gone even to the ends of China, according to ancient texts from the campaigns of Alexander the Great. And uh, we even have uh, a beautiful, beautiful uh, ancient Greek theaters in China uh, to this day. They, it's as if they were constructed yesterday. They're so ex. Let's remember that King David in his youth had to uh, do away with Goliath, his brothers, Goliath's brothers, five of them, six fingers on each hand, six toes on each foot. They were giant Nephilim, uh, Philistines. And we know that even from ancient Greek texts, we know that the Philistines, it's written in the Holy Bible as well, in the Old Testament, the Philistines came from Crete and they were giants. And uh, these are some of the giants, for example, King of uh, King Og of Bashan. It's uh, as we read in the Holy Bible, the Old Testament, he was a giant, the Nephilim and the Anakin. And uh, King David was one of them. Uh, well, actually, they were supposed to be done away with. Now, in the campaigns of Alexander, we read that uh, the uh, writers noted what Alexander was doing in his campaigns and also what they saw in these new lands. And they described the abominable races of these Nephilim. Some of them had no heads. The heads was in the middle of the, of the body. Uh, some of them had uh, half a body of an animal, half a body of a human and these were, of course, not human beings. They had to be done away with. And this is one of the tasks that Alexander the Great had. So I have a Byzantine prophecy uh, WordPress uh, translated for you from Greek. And uh, I'll leave a link below for you. It's 65 pages, but I'm, I'll read from page 61 um, concerning the um, prophecy of St. Andrew of Crete. Salos, Andrew Salos, meaning fool for Christ in uh, Greek. And this is called the Andrew Andreas Salos Apocalypse, Greek text translation, concerning uh, what he says concerning Alexander the Great and the Nephilim in India. So Nikiphorus on two points differs in a remarkable way from the corresponding passage in Pseudo Methodius, uh, saying concerning what happens in Ezekiel 38, 14 to 16, Gog and Magog in the land of Israel. Pseudomethodius enumerates 22 peoples, 22 types of people. First, Pseudomethodius locates the gates to the north, which is the northern location in text influenced by the Bible, Ezekiel 38, 15, whereas the MSS of the life of A.S. Uh, place them in Indalia or Kindinos or India. Okay, so these uh, gates were supposedly in India. The first two variants do not seem to make sense, so it would be attempt attempting to adopt India. It's true that no other source, at least among those known to me, says the gate that gates are in India, but as India plays an important part in the Alexander romance, Nikiforus may have put the gates there more or less carelessly. Secondly, the number of the kings and their peoples is 22 according to Pseudomethodius, but no fewer than 72 according to Nikiphorus. Directly or indirectly, Pseudomethodius arrived at this number from the number of barbarian nations which Alexander the Great traditionally was supposed to have subjugated. Ethni Varvaron, var barbarous nations, and in his turn passed it on to later Apocalypse, who used him as a source. In the earliest work, which is specific on this point, the Syriac Christian legend concerning Alexander, so even the early church of uh, the early Christian church was uh, writing concerning what Alexander the Great had done concerning these Nephilim. The Nephilim that we have in Genesis 3.16, not 3.16, Genesis 6, concerning the Nephilim giants. Well, the early Christian church was also uh, 
examining what Alexander the Great did with these Nephilim. Alexander the Great lived about 330 BC. We know that uh, King David uh, fought with Goliath around 1000 BC, so that's 700 years earlier. Please support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily, and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box. Now, St. Andrew, the fool for Christ, Salos, uh, of Crete, lived about 1000 uh, AD, uh, just as a reference. Now, going to the uh, continuation of this translation, uh, we see that the early Christian church was studying the legend concerning Alexander and what he did with the Nephilims. The number is 24, a number which appears also in other later sources. According to H. Stocks and myself, the writer says this is due to the fact that the foul nations, the abominable nations, is what the, the uh, Greek translation says, which is, of course, the Nephilim, were identified with the offspring of Japheth, one of Noah's three sons, Genesis 10, and thus may have been supposed to represent a third, one third of the 72 biblical peoples. It should be added, however, that none of our sources explicitly allots 24 of the 72 biblical peoples of Japheth. Other numbers, I'm going on, page, we're on page 62 now, are also mentioned in the sources, but as far as I know, Nicky Forrest is the only author who says that the peoples are 72 in number. His motive for that is not quite clear. The fact that he does not mention Gog and Magog could indicate that he's thinking not of a fraction, but of a whole sum of the biblical people, which was 72. On the other hand, he can hardly have meant that Alexander excluded all peoples. Probably he's simply using 72 as a traditional round number of peoples, characterizing as os arithmos, osi amos, thalases, as the, as the sands of the uh, um, as the sands of the sea, which is used uh, of the foul nations, meaning the Nephilim, in the original Greek vision, version, vision of Daniel. Okay, the Nephilim. The expression sarkos anthropos josos, um, I understand the raw flesh of men, pseudo uh, the second Greek vision of Daniel, have simply sarkos anthropon, uh, necron sarkos, uh, dead flesh or a flesh of uh, uh, peop uh, uh, humans. The kithron ikos is dubious. However, the general meaning of the sentence is clear, namely that the sanctuaries will be profaned. Um, ecclesion os oporophilakion. Isaiah 1 8, Pseudomethodius, um, the Arabs appear to be in the guise of foul nations. Uh, I'm just translating here what this says. Ephemius Zigabenus, uh, the, the extort, exhortation to flee, echoes Matthew 24, 16, Mark 3, 14, and Luke 21, 21. Dote ien dis iudeas fevite os daori. Uh, so then, then it, it refers to the uh, Maccabees when the Lord said, and you who are in Judah, flee for the mountains. Don't take with you, don't return to your house to take your coat, things like that. The following statement that Asia will mourn for the islands and the islands for Asia seems to be an adaptation of the prophecy found in the uh, Methodius uh, words. And going on to this, for the belief that Satan will come from the tribe of, tribe of Dan uh, and for his ugliness, uh, and we keep going now, we're on page 30, uh, 63. As to the statement that Christ himself had descended to Hades and bound Antichrist, um, the text seems slightly corrupt, but the sense is clear. According to Revelation 20, it was not Christ himself, but an angel that bound Satan. However, chapter 118 says, I have the keys of death in Hades, indicates that the idea of Christ's ascension to Hades and his fight with Satan and victory over him existed already at the time when the revelation to John was written. The 
traditional opinion was that the witnesses who will appear during the reign of Antichrist are Elias, Elias and Enoch, the life of um, St. Andrew, the fool for Christ here, uh, represents a latter stage of the tradition according to which these two will be joined by John the Evangelist, a version which is also represented by Pseudo Methodius and Pseudo Hippolytus, among others. This belief seems to have been regarded as popular to judge from the commentary of Arethus of Caesarea, Revelation 10 11. Uh, there's some Greek here, but I'm not going to read it for you. Um, 10 11. The variants Oleno, Olenio, Oleninon, which appear here, are seem seem to be the late forms of Olimi, but also far as you know, other instances of particular forms. They apparently represent a development in a direction which came to a dead end, as in most cases of doubt I have followed the reading, he says. Now we go to page 64. Uh, Nikiforus sometimes pretends that he knew uh, St. Andrew, uh, the fool for Christ, personally, and therefore some commentators have dated the composition of the Vita to the 6th century, but the life of St. Uh, Andrew of, of uh, the Fool for Christ is fiction, not a historical document. The number of anachronisms show that it must have been written several centuries after the supposed lifetime of the saint. As I've tried to show above, the theory to the end of the world reflects the apocalyptic tradition in a form it did not develop until after the appearance of the second vision of Daniel, dated to the 9th century. In 6 48, he says that uh, Andrew Salos, the fool for Christ, according to the sources, Simeon Salos, the fool, Simeon, the fool for Christ, lived the 6th century, and his life was written in the middle of the 7th, as the adverb pale indicates that Nikiforus regarded him as a man of ancient times. This is a revealing anachronism. He mentions the Church of the Mother of God in Constantinople, forum built by Basil I, 864 to 866, 867 to 866, uh, among chronological arguments, the reference to the antiphos, uh, the uh, anti-light that is, uh, may be mentioned. Elsewhere, the earliest reference to the anti-light in Constantinople seems to be Constantine Porfirogenitos. Um, uh, sorry. It's not known before the 9th century, it says here, not before the 10th. Further, the mention of a uh, Hartularios ton Plimon in uh, 849 B is clearly anachronistic. On the whole, the author is not greatly concerned with time. At the beginning of the section translated, Nikiforo speaks about the one uh, one week uh, symbolically, but we are not told what week he's referring to. Now he says that the conversation has taken place at night at that in that night, although we have not previously been told that um, uh, Saint Andrew the Fool for Christ and Epi Epiphanius were meeting at night. It's clear, however, that we shall imagine the conversation has taken place not long before the death of the saint. It's the first in the series of conversations on spiritual topics which form the end of the, the life of the saint in which he says farewell to his friend and it's a natural place for an eschatological message. So then it goes into the index of, uh, page 65 goes into the index of uh, proper names. So anyway, the takeaway from this, because it's, it's a long um, study here, a translation. the takeaway from this is that um, the Nephilim, he, Alexander the Great had to do away with the Nephilim. And um, they were the abominable races, the dirty races of these uh, mixtures of animals and human hybrids, uh, as in the days of Noah, you know, before the flood. And uh, he had to do, so Alexander the Great had to do away with them. And the early Christian church was studying Alexander's campaigns, texts, records, journals, concerning these Nephilim uh, races that uh, uh, the uh, Alexander's army did away with and the others that they couldn't do away with, they buried in 
pits, you know, holes in the ground and built uh, various pyramids over them. So uh, this is the takeaway from this. I'll leave a link below for you for this. Um, the first uh, pages have to do with uh, prophecies of the end times, if you want to read it. Um, you go to page 20 or something, 18 to 20, where the English translation starts, and you can uh, skim through that if you'd like. So a lot of these cities are symbolic because the saint refers to uh, Constantinople, which is today Istanbul. It refers to Salonika, which was uh, the second city after I Istanbul in uh, Christendom. And uh, a lot of saints, uh, very famous Christian saints, come from Salonika. And he also mentions Rome. So uh, it could be, these are, could be symbolic cities as well. So the early Christian church knew about the Nephilim and that Alexander the Great had to do away with them. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, this is not taught in history, but here we have the actual text and translation of it into English. Uh, please leave your comments and thank you for your support.